this episode of the high the high welcome to this episode of the high welcome to this episode of the i hate matt wall poetry podcast and more and stuff today is um going to be a very freaking serious episode if you are going to be triggered by talking about serious stuff you might want to wait on this episode for a bit if you um are a poet i think it's very important for you to listen to this episode just straight up like this is some serious crap here um and it's it's funny because this topic came up by complete accident i was having a discussion with um matthew buckley smith um i hope he doesn't mind me throwing him under the bus on this but uh we were having a conversation and um i couldn't remember the name of hart crane like i couldn't remember like i'm like oh that dude who freaking dove into the propeller of a ship ah and i couldn't remember his name and so i'm googling it and then the first thing that pops up is this thing that we're going to be talking about here in a minute so before we get too far into this Let me try to fund this up a little bit, and then we'll get into the serious shit. When you are hearing this episode, I will be lounging in a cowboy pool in the desert, trying to effing relax. We will see how that goes. Just because I'm out of town, chillaxing with what I just saw an ad for today, Bud Light Chilada with Taheen. Are you effing kidding me? Sign me up. You can still find out what it's like to see me as an action figure. Okay? This is my new chat book for the month of April, which is almost over. Um, it's got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 poems in here. And I will tell you what they're called, I guess. Um, Kenny and Annie, the prettiest girl in sixth grade. Chicks got it made. Time ticks by like the wings of a hummingbird. For Charlie. Liquor shanty. Blue eyes at five o'clock. My hometown current year. It could happen again, maybe. First kiss and the lunchbox. So, these poems are about my childhood. Kind of a nostalgic look at things. Um... A couple of the poems are like from me is like, I mean, one of them's from me is like a toddler. So that that's a fun thing to think about. Um, But yeah, so there's uh, quite a few fun little ones in here. One of these uh, makes me extremely emotional and it's weird. Um, I'm not going to do it today because I just, I can't handle it right now. But one of the poems in here I wrote probably a couple years ago. When I wrote it, I was bawling my eyes out as I was typing. And then I read it probably a year ago, thinking about putting it into a collection. And I read it and I started crying. And I couldn't fucking... I'm like, I I don't even want to look at this fucking poem. And then when I was putting this book together, I'm like, if I'm ever going to put that poem into something, this is the book I'm going to put it into. And I read it. When I was trying to do my edit on it, just making sure everything was spelt right and shit, started crying like a fucking baby. So, whatever. So, this is me as an action figure. And for those of you who are just listening to the audio, it's on this beautiful gold metallic paper. It is my head on a He-Man figure. And the me as an action figure is supposed to kind of look like the font of like the masters of the universe stuff it's not quite it but it was the closest i could find um but it's a beautiful book i love the way it turned out so yeah so that'll be over at my etsy shop links will be down below and really quick let's get into those motherfucking shout outs okay so here we go I want to give a big thank you to those motherfuckers over on Patreon. Oh, and just so you know, if you are a Patreon member, if you go to Patreon now, there's only going to be one tier you could hit. 
I think I only have one on there now, but it's the $5 tier. And I think what I'm going to do to make that different is that I, I know I've done all sorts of things and I've done postcards, I've done all this shit and whatever. I think I'm just going to put like one new poem um, up on Patreon a week, even though I hate the way my poems look when um, they go up on Patreon. So in the past I was taking pictures, like screenshots because I just, I, I think the format of Patreon just does not look nice. But if you are one of those people who don't want to do the YouTube thing and would rather do Patreon, that's what will be there for you. So thank you to Michael, to Cedar, to Harry. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Over at the YouTube thank you crew, I want to give a thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to JH, to Jan, and to Deb. And a big thank you to our newest Thank you, fucker, over there. Ethan, thank you so much. And then over in the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Minnie, to Thomas, to Tim, to Shaylin, to Tim, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, and to Adam. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. And then, for the biggest swinging pendulums, we have the people in the Chapbook of the Month Club over there on YouTubes. I want to give a thank you to Caitlin and to Chase. You guys are the shit. Thank you so much. And now, on with the show. Let me get a cigarette going here since we're going to be talking about the thing that Kurt Vonnegut said. Um, he was committing suicide slowly every day with. Let me get on this shit. Just in general, it's really hard to not like Kurt Vonnegut. That motherfucker, dude. Some of you may not be a huge fan of his writing or how he writes, but the things that he says, how could you not fucking just think he is just the most lovable fucking human being on the planet? Was. Sorry. Alright. Enough about that. Like the episode title states... Today we're going to be talking about poets and we're going to be talking about suicide. So, um, two things that are horribly depressing. <laughs> oh, fuck me. Okay, so anyway, so I was trying to remember Hart Crane's name and I couldn't fucking think of it for the life of me. And so I was thinking and thinking and I just couldn't fucking place it and, and I did the Google search and this is what popped up when I Googled it. The first thing that popped up on Google said Dr. Ludwig found that roughly 20% of eminent poets had committed suicide compared with a suicide rate of 4% for all the professions examined the suicide rate in the general United States population is around 1% so um, I have not read this New York Times article that this is referring to which is from 2004, and it is uh, called Going Early Into That Good Night. I don't know what the other professions that were examined were, but I'm going to make a guess based on another article we're going to be going over what those were, and we'll talk about that when we get to that. But so I see this thing. 20% of poets commit suicide. That's one in five, Okay. That means, like, according to this, if you belong to a writer's group or you get together with a bunch of poets and you guys, like, write poetry and share it back and forth and all this other stuff, according to this, I mean, I guess if you are eminent, okay, but, you know, whatever. There's other studies that show kind of the same thing here, but... That means, like, let's say there's 10 people in that group. Let's see if I can fucking do math here. If there's 10 people in that group that you do this with, two of those poets will commit suicide. That's fucking crazy. That is shocking. That is fucking terrifying. Okay? But it also makes a lot of sense. I could totally see it. I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, okay, so this article was from 2004. That was a bit ago. And I think the actual study was done in the mid-90s that Dr. Ludwig 
has done here. So when I was talking to Bucks about this, like he looked up some stuff because he was also shocked by these numbers and he looked up something else and found this thing from Malcolm Gladwell uh, that was posted in 2019, the end of 2019. Now, what I'm going to say is that these numbers, I think, might be a little different now if the, all of the actual studies we have are pre-COVID. I'm going to go out on a fucking limb here and say that COVID, especially when it comes to any form of death, any study that measures the death of certain groups of people, because of COVID and the pandemic and the lockdown, I think all numbers are going to be totally fucking skewed for like probably the next 10 years. This might be the closest thing we have, but at the same time, Malcolm Gladwell might just be talking about the shit that he found when he Googled this. But anyway, so I guess Malcolm Gladwell had something called Talking to Strangers in 2019. And this is called Poets Die Young. And it's a selection from that. Poets Die Young. That is not just a cliche. The life expectancy of poets as a group trails playwrights, novelists, and nonfiction writers by a considerable margin. They have higher rates of emotional disorders than actors, musicians, composers, and novelists. In every occupational category, poets have far and away the highest suicide rates, as much as five times higher than the general population. Something about writing poetry appears either to attract the wounded or to open new wounds. Of and few have so perfectly embodied that image of the doom genius as Sylvia Plath. Now, real quick, this is what I don't like when I'm reading stuff that has factual shit in it. Okay? That sounds funny, but hear me out. When someone starts throwing facts out, okay, talking about like numbers and blah, 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 and then says, something about writing poetry appears either to attract the wounded or open new wounds. When you start throwing opinions after facts, and I know like every editorial, this is what that is, but a lot of people don't see when the um, train tracks change, you know, like they just keep reading and they're like, oh, all of this is fact. So this is an assumption, and I really think that poetry attracts the wounded much more than opens new wounds. Like, I don't think a poet out there is like, oh man, I just love poetry. Poetry is so fun. I'm writing poetry. Oh my god. Like, I've just been brutalized by my poetry. Like, opening new wounds is not something I think poetry ever has done. Okay, I think people are attracted to poetry because people who are poets are usually pretty much um, introverted people who don't have a very good support system. And if they do have a support system, it might not be a good one. So then they end up spilling their guts into their pages. Okay, but again, that is my opinion. Okay, so, and then back on Plath, like, I, I don't know. Here, here's the thing. If this many poets are fucking committing suicide, like, why is it Sylvia Plath's fault? I hate that Plath is, like, the poster child for a suicidal poet. Anyway, okay, so Plath was obsessed with suicide. She wrote about it, thought about it. She talked about suicide in much the same tone as she talked about other risky testing activity, urgently, even fiercely, but altogether without self-pity, Alvarez wrote. Sylvia Plath had a long history of emotional instability. She was treated with electroshock therapy for depression while still in college. She made her first suicide attempt in 1953. 
She spent six months in psychiatric care at McLean Hospital outside Boston. A few years later, she deliberately drove her car into a river, then in typical fashion, wrote a poem about it. And like the cat, I have nine times to die. This is number three. Okay, so all that was taken out of Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. But, as you would assume, there are a crap ton more things about this. So, this whole Sylvia Plath thing, I was like, oh, and it turns out there's something called the Sylvia Plath effect. How do I know it's a thing? Because there's a Wikipedia page about it. Duh. So, the Sylvia Plath effect is a phenomenon that poets are more susceptible to mental illness than create than other creative writers. The term was coined, the term was coined in 2001 by psychologist James C. Kaufman, and implications and possibilities for future research are discussed. The effect is named after Sylvia Plath, who died by suicide at the age of 30. Oh my god. Um, Building on more general research that from early adolescence to adulthood, women are twice as likely as men to experience depression. This is very shocking. I don't know if women are twice as likely to experience depression than men, but I think women are more able to talk about it. I feel like a lot of men do experience depression and never, ever say it, never talk about it, never do anything about it because of how society kind of shits on depression and shits on mental illness. And the second, especially in America, the second you are down and you can't pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you're not a man anymore. All that phony baloney John Wayne fucking bullshit, that's a bunch of crap. So, um, not to say that, like, we shouldn't be worried about women poets, I'm just saying that I think these numbers are going to be skewed just based off of that. So Kaufman's work further demonstrated that female poets were more likely to experience mental illness than any other class of writers. In addition, female poets were more likely to be mentally ill than other eminent women, such as politicians, actresses, and artists. Now, I'm going to say this right now, and if anyone knows what's been going on with John Fetterman, you will know this right away. Politicians are not allowed to say they suffer from mental illness. Are you fucking joking me? A politician cannot publicly say they suffer from mental illness, or else their opposition will use that as a, like attack strategy. Mental illness is still horribly vilified in this country and in other places across the world. Okay. So throwing politics, this is so funny. It's like, Oh, actresses, artists, musicians, filmmakers, and politicians. What the fuck does a politician have to do with fucking anything with these groups of people? It's like one of these things are not like the other figure it out. It's so fucking stupid. Although many studies, and this is um, talking about uh, an 87 study, an 89 study, and the Ludwig 95 study, have demonstrated that creative writers are prone to mental illness. Okay, in one study, 1,629 writers were analyzed for signs of mental illness. Female poets were found to be significantly more likely to experience mental illness than female fiction writers or male writers of any type. Another study extended the analysis of 520 eminent women, poets, fiction writers, nonfiction writers, visual artists, politicians, and actresses. Again, politicians should not be thrown into this study if you want it to fucking make any sense. And again, found the poets to be significantly more likely to experience mental illness. 
In another study performed by the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Kentucky Medical Center, female writers were found to be more likely to suffer not only from mood disorders, but also from panic attacks, general anxiety, drug abuse, and eating disorders. The rates of multiple mental disorders were also higher among these writers. Although it was not explored in depth, abuse during childhood, physical or sexual, also loomed as a possible contributor to psychological issues in adulthood. What I want to say about this is that that right there shows that a lot of people who have had fucked up lives turn to poetry, like basically as a form of therapy, okay? Like, what I want to make sure no one gets out of this and that no one uses for how I'm doing this. I don't want anyone to go, oh, well, Matt's saying that, um, like, if you're a poet, like, that causes suicide or being a poet causes depression. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying being a poet is oftentimes the byproduct of of severe, fucked up mental disorders, depression, and abuse. And this is what we have to work with it. These are the fucking tools we have to deal with these things. That's what I'm saying. After several suicide attempts, John Horder, her close friend, felt Plath was at risk of further harm and prescribed her antidepressants mere days before Plath took her own life. He also visited with her daily and made many attempts to have her admitted to a hospital. Upon her refusal, he made arrangements for a live-in nurse. Some critics have argued that because antidepressants usually take up to three weeks to take effect, her prescription from Horder may not have been of any help. Others say that Plath's American doctor had warned her never again to take the antidepressant drug prescribed by Horder, as it was found to worsen her depression but he supposedly prescribed it under a proprietary name, which she did not recognize. Here is what I'll say, and because this is something that has actually come up very recently in my live streams with people who I've been talking to and stuff, when you are taking antidepressants, a lot of people will say, they will give you this argument that antidepressants worsen depression. A lot of people say that antidepressants cause depression and cause suicide. And you'll notice that if you ever see those ads for an antidepressant, it'll say, um, taking this could cause suicidal thoughts, um, suicide, um, worsening depression, blah, 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 blah. When your doctor prescribes you antidepressants, they will usually say, now, if you have any suicidal thoughts now that you're taking these call call your doctor call me let me know there are reasons for this okay and one of the reasons for this is is that a it takes so fucking long for most people to fucking see a doctor about this okay like you're usually like you see a doctor and then you have to wait three weeks or three months to be able to see um, a psychologist. And then you go to the psychologist, tell the psychologist all your problems. And then your psychologist is like, wow, you really should see a psychiatrist and try to get some medicine for this. So let's set an appointment up for that. And then that takes another couple months, anywhere from a few weeks to a couple months. And then so by the time you are seeing the psychiatrist, usually you are so fucking far gone that waiting another three weeks for the medicine to kick in might be too late, okay? The other thing here is there are a lot of people who feel like once they are taking antidepressants that they must be really fucked up. And the idea of taking something that's supposed to help you like trigger something in a lot of people that, oh man, I'm one of those now. I'm so far off the deep end or the people in your life, like your family and your friends start like vilifying you for having to fucking take that because you're too fucking crazy to fucking live without it. And you're too much of a fucking coward to face life the right way. 
all of that's bullshit. Don't ever fucking listen to motherfuckers who say shit like that. Okay? It does take a while for meds to work. And I've talked about this before. I've talked about the whole thing I had with Pharma Phoenix Rises and the whole fucking thing. Just because you get prescribed some medication does not mean things are going to get fixed. Because a lot of times the medication that you get is not right for you. So it is a process. And you have to be very open with your psychiatrist about this and say, like how you're feeling, if you like this medicine, if you don't like this medicine, and then explain why you don't like it. For the longest time, it was really hard for me to be able to be on antidepressants because when I was on antidepressants, I couldn't do anything. Like, it just, like, like completely fucked me up. And then when there were some that were kind of making me, like, feel better... Like, I still couldn't create. And when I can't create, that causes a whole other fucking depression I have. But there were times when I felt like my head was, like, in a pillow. Or my head was, like, in, like, a bunch of cotton. And there was just, like, a lot of pressure. And that was driving me crazy, you know? Um, there were other pills I took that just made me completely almost catatonic. Like I'm just like laying on a couch. Like I remember one time when I was on this medication, uh, I ended up watching the fucking view because I couldn't be bothered to get up, to get the remote, to change the channel. I'm like, eh, this is my life now. I'll just watch this. And it was awful and I was miserable, but I just did not have the will to get up off the couch to change the channel. But when you do find something that works, that's a cool thing. Like, it's amazing when, like, you could actually start feeling better and not have your head feel like it's in a blender. You know what I'm saying? So it is a process. And when you are on medication... So if anyone out there is listening to this fucking episode and you are super fucking depressed... And you are either on medication or about to start medication. Give yourself a fucking pat on the back. Because what you have done so far is something huge that a lot of people don't do. You are trying to fucking have a better life. You're trying to fix a problem. And it's not an easy fix. And it is very hard to do, but you are fucking doing it. So fucking good job on you and congratulations for fucking making that happen. And just stick with it because it is a process. And those first three weeks are tricky. Taking pills every day that are supposed to make you feel better, but you're not feeling anything different. And you're like, what's the fucking point? You just got to stick with it. Three weeks is nothing. You can do that in your sleep. Okay. But just know that you're doing the right thing. And just be very, very open with your psychiatrist about how you're feeling and the symptoms you're feeling and the symptoms that you don't like. And between trying different medications and adding medications together, you will eventually be able to find something that works for you and makes you feel better. Okay, so enough of me on my high horse there. Suicide is a fucking horrifying thing. And um, I can't remember what the study was that I saw, but, um, oh, if I can't remember, I shouldn't talk about it. But there is a growing number of people who know a family member who has committed suicide. And that's kind of heavy, you know. When I did my book, All My Friends Are Dead, that was written because a bunch of my friends were dying but a couple were suicides and one of them was a very close friend um, that I had for many years and that really fucked me up and I know it's not about me you know but it's still it makes you start thinking about stuff 
you know. And that's kind of one of those curses that come with suicide. Like, yeah, you commit suicide, whatever. But now all your friends and family have to deal with that. And that was kind of always the thing, I think, that kept me from suicide. Was like, oh man, I really don't want to put my family through this. I especially don't want to put my kid through this. Oh, and then like, who's going to find me? And and like the articles say, like I've written lots of poems about suicide. And feeling like, God, I can't even fucking commit suicide without feeling guilty about it. Because of like, who's going to find me and shit. This is a bunch of fucking bullshit, you know? I don't know. I think like as somebody, um, cause some of you might not have been in mental institutions or anything like that. Um, I have been, it's probably a little TMI, but I have been in, um, a mental facility on two different occasions and they were both when I was much younger. Um, one of them was when I really thought I was going to do it. Um, I was hurting myself a lot, um, just to do it and for the rush of pain, um, and having the pain be something that makes me not think of my problems. I went and talked to somebody and I think it was like the, really the first real time I had talked to with like a therapist or a psychiatrist or whatever psychologist. And they wanted me to just go into the facility. So I did. I checked myself in. Being at a facility, I think more than anything, will show you um, how you don't really have it that bad. Because when you get there, you will see people who have it way worse than you. Who are fucking like going through some shit. And it will make you feel so much better about yourself. And I don't mean this in like a shitty fucking way. But like when you see a woman who has fucking staples all across her throat and up the sides of her fucking neck and all down her arms because she was tired of looking at herself in a mirror when she was in the bathtub and broke the mirror and just fucking went to town on herself. And then she's like trying to fucking be normal knowing that everyone in the room can see like the fucking Frankenstein fucking staples all up and down her, you know, like I didn't have it that bad. So I remember there was this one dude who was a middle aged gay man who thought he was Madonna. And, um, every night at like eight o'clock, um, he would, that was the time he had to go on stage. And so he would dance and sing up and down the halls, um, Madonna songs. And it was early Madonna, so I didn't mind. Because that was, that was always the best stuff. Um, and then, and again, back in this time, like, I had, uh, like, a big, giant, dyed mohawk and pe- piercings all over my face and tattoos and shit. And I remember I was sitting there, and this woman walked in who kind of looked like Kathy Bates... If Kathy Bates was a hundred pounds heavier and had been floating in a lake for a couple days, and she came in and was standing across the room from me, and she like looked at me and smiled, and you know I nodded my head at her, and she said, "You know, you would be so handsome." You're very good looking. You would be so handsome if you didn't have all that shit coming out of your face. And then she fucking charged at me. And um, she was like screaming and shaking her head and her hair was fucking going and she had her fucking mitts out at me and shit. And I was just leaning up against the wall in a chair, like, you know, doing my fucking thing. And she came at me and luckily for me, the orderlies weren't that far away and they tackled her before she got to me. <clears throat> but um, that was kind of scary. I was like, oh, wasn't expecting that tonight. And then um, you, you share rooms and everything like that. Like, it's like two people to a room. And um, I remember I went in and got in bed to go to sleep. 
and th- there was this old man sitting on the bed next to me and he's like like he never said hi to me he didn't say anything to me like I nodded to him you know did the whole thing and then I close my eyes and I just hear don't you think for a second that I haven't thought about killing you in your sleep and I'm like oh so that's how this is gonna go (laughs) And then I woke up in the middle of the night one night with, um, like, in a lot of pain. And I opened my eyes, and a fucking, this big-ass orderly fucking was, like, had a fucking, I put an IV in me and was shooting me up with something. Didn't tell me what it was, didn't fucking even wake me up to let me know he was going to do it. Um, that was fucking terrifying. So, basically, you end up doing all this shit. And then by the time the doctor, the um, psychologist or whoever the fuck it is who's running the fucking show, finally comes to see you. Like, the first time I was there, it took... I, I checked in Friday morning or Friday afternoon, but the doctor had already left. And I couldn't see the doctor again until... Or see, for the first time until Monday. So I had to sit there through the fucking weekend. Like with all this fucking madness and shit and the doctor sits me down he's like how are you feeling I'm like I am feeling so sane and happy I just want to get the fuck out of here because I didn't realize how good I had it and there are some people in here who definitely need help and I am not one of those people so please can you show me the door and um, I don't know I passed whatever tests I needed to pass and then I fucking left so fast forward a couple years I was feeling kind of down in those dumps again. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to fucking go to a doctor. I'm not going to fucking go do shit. I know what will fucking straighten me out. And I fucking walked right back into that fucking mental hospital. And I checked myself in. And uh, and they're like, like, why are you here? I'm like, because I kind of want to kill myself. And I know if I'm in here for a couple days, I'm not going to want to do that no more. And they're like, why do you say that? I'm like... Like, you guys work here. You know what this is like. Like, quit fucking with me. Like, just let's fucking get on with the fucking show, Graham. Do the fucking thing. Let me fucking sign my name on something. Sign my life away. I'll give you all my shit that's in my pockets and just fucking put me in a bed. Jesus fucking Christ. So, um, I'm not recommending that every poet just go check themselves into somewhere. Because um, a lot of times, you know, somewheres are not a good place to be. But, um... It uh, cleaned my clock a couple times. And um, now, with my depression, and ever since then, really, like, I've been writing songs and poetry about some of the stuff that I'm going through that helps me through this shit. It's my therapy. It's important. And that's why we do it. You know? It's part of who we are, and it's a part of how we process. And if our creations can help others if our creations can entertain others if you can laugh at my misery then maybe that was for something you know what i'm saying like not everything has to be so fucking goddamn serious all the fucking time but um it's good to laugh at ourselves you know like the whole look back and laugh kind of thing because the biggest thing for all of us is to however we feel right now to just go man you know what in five years we're gonna look back at this and laugh like if that's the fucking case then fuck yeah dude um that's not always how it goes but like fingers crossed right okay um and then the last thing i want to really get into with this um and i'm gonna try to leave like good notes in the notes of this here a while back i was not a while back because it hasn't been that long actually this was only um, april 10th the breaking form podcast did an episode called elegy and it is um it's it's for me one of their better episodes um but they have a lot of links in their show notes and um i'm gonna have those um in here as well text or call 988 for a 24-hour suicide hotline. 
Okay. Like if you are feeling, um, like I don't want you guys to be those statistics. Like I don't want us to be that 20%. You know what I'm saying? The last thing they had in here, and I think it's something that's important to have in this, uh, is the um, number for the Trevor Project, 866-4-U-TREVOR, T-R-E-V-O-R. Um, so again, all this stuff will be down in the notes. But I want to say too, you know what? I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go get it. Hang on. When I say I'm going to go get something, I really need to make sure I know where that thing is. This is a, um, this is out of uh, On the Walls and in the Streets, American Poetry Broadsides from the 1960s by James D. Sullivan. I'm not a huge fan of this book, although it is one of the only books I could find that has some of this information in it. But in this book, it has um, a broadside by um, Etheridge Knight, who has a poem in here called For Black Poets Who Think of Suicide. And I'll show you what, it, what the broadside looks like there. So you take a look at it. But I'm going to read this poem to you. Sorry, this print is really small. Black poets should live, not leap, from steel bridges like the white boys do. Black poets should live, not lay, their necks on railroad tracks like the white boys do. Black poets should seek, but not search too much, in sweet, dark caves, nor hunt for snipes, down psychic trails like the white boys do. For black poets belong to black people, art the flutes of black lovers. Oh wait, no, sorry. Are the flutes of black lovers, are the organs of black sorrows, are the trumpets of black warriors. Let all black poets die as trumpets and not be bur buried in the dust of marching feet. So that's just like, even in the 60s, okay, some like, what would that be? 50 or 60 fucking years ago now other poets knew that other poets killed themselves okay this has been like a serious problem for a very long time it's just shocking when you see what the numbers are when only 1% of Americans commit suicide and 20% of poets commit suicide and female poets are more likely to do that than male poets that's crazy it's just it's something that we need to talk about and something that we need to understand and something that other poets need to be there for other poets because of this okay so that's all I'll say about it um check those numbers out and hotlines out and stuff like that and i will talk to you all later i just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible anarchy crew and my followers on patreon i appreciate the hell out of you guys and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible you guys are awesome and if you'd like to join the crew or the anarchy crew just hit the join button beneath this video and if you'd like to become a member of my patreon you can run over to the link down below to do that as well thank you